Good afternoon. How is everyone? Good. Okay, thank you. Well, welcome to the El Paso Energy Auditorium. I'm Laura Samariba, the Community Engagement Manager for the El Paso Museum of Art. Thank you for joining us today for this program, which is in conjunction with the Tom Lee Month, with the Tom Lee Month festivities organized by the Tom Lee Institute. Today we are pleased to have Judy Smith present on the relationship between Tom Lee and the editor of Life magazine, Dan Longwell. Before we continue, though, kindly take this moment to turn your cell phones to silent or off. Uh, now, the El Paso Museum of Art is proud to serve as a hosting institution for several of the programs offered in the month of October, which are part of Tom Lee Month. These programs are generously funded by El Paso Electric Company, National Endowment for the Humanities, JP and Mary John Bryan, Bill and Ann Keeley, Mattress Firm, Texas Monthly, Betty Ruth Wakefield Haley, Hunt Family Foundation, Humanities Texas, El Paso Times, AT&T, Casa Ford Lincoln Nissan, El Paso Museums and Cultural Affairs Department, Las Palmas del Sol, Western Refining, the El Paso CBD, City Private Bank, and West Star Bank. We welcome Judy Smith today in the first of two lectures at the El Paso Museum of Art, celebrating the art of Tom Lee, one of El Paso's foremost artists. Judy is a graduate of Tulane University and attended Yale on a Woodrow Wilson scholarship. After completing one year at Yale, uh, the Graduate School in International Relations. Judy subsequently worked for Life Magazine in New York, then as a researcher for National Geographic Magazine in Washington, D.C. Judy returned to her home of Neosho, Missouri, and obtained a teaching certificate at Missouri Southern College in Joplin. After 12 years of teaching at the Neosho Junior High, Judy obtained a specialist in education degree from Pittsburgh State University in Kansas. Now retired in Neosho, Judy is writing the biography of Daniel Longwell and has contributed research to the Longwell Museum at Crowder College. So it is my honor to present to you Judy Smith. fun to hear all those old credentials. <laughs> I am very glad that uh, Laura read all of the people who are supporting Tom Lee Month because I was going to do the same thing. I think you have a fantastic program and you should be very, very proud of it. And I'm honored and humbled to be a part of it. Uh, I'm going to start this out is with picture that Tom Lee, a portrait Tom Lee did, whoops, there it is. I discovered this portrait at Columbia University, and I need to say right off at the beginning that everything I have to say has been gleaned from materials at Columbia University's archives in their Butler Library, and also the Time Incorporated archives in New York City. This particular portrait, I thought I had found it first. I only recently learned that actually Matt Greeley had found it first. But when I Googled Tom Lee, I found Tom Lee Institute and I phoned them and they very graciously said that I could use it and I have. I want to tell you that this portrait was done in 1945 and when it arrived at the Longwell home, in New York City, they cabled to Tom, portrait is wonderful, both very thrilled, think you are wonderful too, letter coming. Well, before they got a letter to them, Tom Lee wrote them a letter. Dear Dan and Mary, I've been tempted to write you ever since I sent the portrait, and ever since you sent the telegram saying you liked it. There is a real joy in working on a head like Dan's. It has forms for an artist to get his hooks onto. Nothing small or vague or indecisive. 
And I love that portrait. When I first saw it, I just gasped. Because I, in doing my own research on Mr. Longwell, I learned what a terrific person he was with energy and ideas in every direction. And in my opinion, Tom captured that. But I thought, since Longwell was a man who favored photographs, that I would show you a photograph. I shouldn't say he favored them, but Life Magazine started out being a picture magazine to have photographs tell a story. So I'm going to show you a couple uh, that were in the Longwell files. This is Dan in 1947. That would be two years after Tom Lee did his portrait. He's at his desk, and this portrait, with this photograph was taken for the office newsletter to announce that he was going to London to meet with Dan Long, I mean, to meet with Winston Churchill to sign the papers for the Churchill memoirs. And he is the one that is responsible for having got those memoirs available for Life Magazine and for the American public to read before they came out in print. Uh, when the portrait arrived and Tom had sent it to Dan and Mary, Dan sent a letter back. And this is and I'm just going to read you a portion of this. Thank you for your letter to Mary and me. The portrait came home from the framers yesterday and now is in my room. It frightens me a little. I look so firm and impressive. But Mary and the girls seem to like it, so I'm very flattered. I don't know that I selected the right frame for it. I saw some warm chestnut that looked nice, about three inches high and three deep and beveled. Then I asked them to put an inch of coarse linen around inside. It's a wonderful frame, but I look at myself in that setting and get frightened. I'm having rather an experience, but I'm profoundly grateful to you, Tom. I take pleasure in the picture, and I take even greater pleasure in Mary's pride in it. This is Mary. Life magazine was established November 23rd, 1936. And after he got the magazine going, and she was a part of the experimental department that worked on it, they married in December of 1938. Mary Longwell had been at Time Incorporated from almost its first year. She had been secretary to Britton Hayden, who had established Life Magazine with Harry Luce, Henry Luce. And uh, she was there her entire career and worked her way up to be chief of research for every magazine. And I wish I had time to tell you more about Mary because that process in itself was fascinating. And as a reporter for life myself, from 1962 to 64, I did everything Mary had set up for us to do. Now, some of you in the audience may not know what Life Magazine was. There is still a Life Magazine that you can get on the stands. This magazine, I bought it day before yesterday. It cost $17. It's just a special issue, and this one's all about the Beatles. The magazine that Tom Lee worked for was this size, and it cost 10 cents. It was so popular when it was first put out that the presses couldn't keep up with the demand. In fact, Dan used to go around saying that he'd lost millions of dollars when he was editor. And it wasn't that he lost millions of dollars. It, he meant that they could not get the millions that people were willing to pay for it. Anyway, um, Tom Lee and Dan Longwell, the intersection of those two men, 
Wait, I'm stopped. When Dan wrote to Tom that the girls and Mary liked the portrait, these are the girls. They never had children, but they were lovers of dachshunds. And that's almost a story in itself, and I wish I had time to tell you that. Now this was the pre-publication party, the pre-publication of life. Harry Luce had married Claire Booth Luce in the spring of 1936. And Dan Longwell and Mary were working with the experimental dummies for Life magazine. And Dan was a promoter of the First Order. He had been at Doubleday for over 10 years, and he was in charge of the trade books. Now, trade books are the publishing world's term for books that make money not the reference books. And so Dan was very interested in promoting books of all kinds. And there is some talk, I think, that, that Dan Marco, what Tom Lee told you, that he met Dan Longwell through Frank Doby. And I cannot verify that. I don't, to me, he met Dan Longwell through Holland McCombs. Okay, that would be right because he knew his work, not Tom, but they knew. Oh, okay, that makes sense because Dan always had an eye for art. He was always looking for a way to sell books, and the cover of Apache Gold and Yaki Silver would have struck him as a good-looking book on the shelf. So he knew the name Tom Lee. So then we scoot ahead to 1941. The war had taken really bad turns in Europe. And Dan and Harry, Mr. Luce both felt that war would be coming to the United States, I mean that the United States would be joining that war effort. But they also knew that the population was not at all in favor of joining it. Uh, they had learned how horrible World War I was, and there was no desire to move into World War II. So they determined that it was their res journalistic responsibility to tell the American public about our military, how it was, how the defenses were being built, and the whole purpose of Life Magazine had been to make America proud. They loved to tell everything wonderful, industry, education, agriculture, even stories out in the middle of Kansas, they discovered that people like to know those sorts of good pieces of news. At any rate, in 1941, Dan and two other major editors went to Washington and got permission to visit many of the bases around the country. And Dan was sent to, uh, he chose rather, I guess, to go to Fort Sam Houston and then out to the Marines in San Diego and up to General Stilwell in northern San Francisco. Anyway, when he got there, he discovered immediately that they were going to have to have something in color. If you look at old Life magazines, 1936, 37, 38, etc., they are going to be pretty much black and white photographs. The color in the magazines are the advertisements. And that's because they, Eastman Kodak had not yet developed a film that would, uh, could be used quickly and processed quickly. And so consequently, Dan came up with the idea, why not use war artists? That had been done in the Civil War, it had been done uh, in World War I, a little bit by the Europeans, especially those who drew for um, London Illustrated News, which, by the way, was sold in New York. I didn't know that until I started this. Anyway, Dan Longwell said to Holland McCombs, go get Tom Lee. Holland and Dan were also, uh, that's, sorry, that's Holland McCombs with Mary Longwell, and that picture was taken. Uh, 
when he visited Neosho, or it might have been taken in 71 at, the, at his own ranch. Anyway, so he went to Holland Cut, Tom, and the, the, the letters there, or they aren't letters, they're wires. They go back and forth saying, he's out on the desert, but he's coming in, and so forth. Anyhow, finally, Tom got there. And I'm just going to read you a little of how that thing went. Here's what Longwell said. I quickly realized that you had to do something in color to show what the Army was really like and telegraphed back for Thompson and Field to watch for possible use of artists. General Simpson, later commander of the Ninth Army, was my host at Fort St. Houston. He, General Lucas, and I picked out an old Army sergeant in the regular Army as a good close-up for that issue. Now that issue was going to be the defense issue for July the 7th, 1941. I asked Holland McCombs to get Tom Lee to come over from El Paso and paint the sergeant's portrait. Well, Tom Lee did. You maybe cannot see this, but here is the first army color in the magazine. And that's, I, it is a good, strong picture. Another uh, general said he wished that that portrait was hung in every barracks. And, I, and then there's a wonderful story about the sergeant there too. Okay, now. He's had such success with Tom Lee, and I, I can tell that Tom Lee was the kind of person that Dan Longwell was going to like. Clean cut, educated, dedicated to what he was doing, forthright, all those sorts of characteristics. He loved his wife, he loved his son, and those were the kinds of people they unlocked. As an aside, where is that funny picture? That is Henry Luce and Dan Longwell. And the reason I, this is an aside. My husband hates when you have these asides. But, there are only two pictures of this, I think, in existence. And one of them is at Columbia, and the other one is in a leather-bound book with a lot of other photographs that Dan was responsible for or that were part of Dan's uh, career at Life Magazine. And when he retired, he didn't want a dinner, he didn't want anything, so the boys put together a leather-bound volume of what they thought would be mementos that would remind him of his career and everything in life. And this is one of those. I, I don't know how I stumbled onto the fact that there was a miniature, and I thought that'd be this, but it's this size, that Henry Luce liked the booklet the boys had put together so well that he had another one made for himself. And you can buy that at the Cummins Rare Bookstore in New York City for $8,000. I think that's pretty funny. I think Mary Longwell took the book apart, I believe, and kept the photographs, and that is the photograph that's in the file at Columbia. So, uh, and I also thought I would share it with you because later on, in, in my last trip up there, Dan wrote in, I came across what he had written to John Shaw Billings, who was a co-editor with him, saying how it used to be. And the girls on the cover of Life magazine always had to be good girls. And he was sick and tired of seeing some of the things he was seeing now, even men in topless bathing suits. <laughs> I think he forgot about that one. All right, this is a 
paint, this is a photograph taken by Carl Mygans. Carl is the one at the head of the table, so to speak. He set his camera to take this. This is in Wheelock, Texas in 1971 when Dan had already died and Mary took me with her to this reunion. I want to point this out here because I think it relates to the rest of the letters. You have Holland McCombs, who was head of Time Inc. office in Dallas, and you know the relationship between him and Tom Lee. Then you have Sarah Lee and Tom Lee. Carl Mydans is the person who took the photograph of MacArthur coming ashore when they retook the Philippines. He and his wife, Shelley, who's the next lady in the picture, were incarcerated by the Japanese and uh, didn't have any more, uh, well, you can imagine. And so at that, the next person in the photograph is myself and then Mary Longwell. I have never been to any sort of convention or anything like that weekend was. Carl and Shelley talked about what it was like being incarcerated, and Tom Lee what, talked about what it was like to have the president's portrait turned down when he had done the portrait for uh, Lyndon Johnson. But it didn't, it, Mrs. Johnson had commissioned it, but Mr. Johnson wanted a different background, and Tom Lee said no. I thought it was good. Anyway, um, the rest of this talk is going to be pretty much just correspondence between the two gentlemen. Uh, after the work had been done and had been so successful from the Sergeant Bieber portrait, Dan decided that they needed to get somebody out into combat areas somehow. That had never been done before. But what he did was he talked um, uh, the public relations officer for the Navy down in Washington. He talked him into letting Tom Lee be sent to Argentia up in the Newfoundland area. And as you know, Dan had already discovered that Tom Lee is a presentable person. And I don't know if I've got young students in here or not, but I can tell you that if you expect to make a success in the world, you need to make yourself very presentable. And I think Tom Lee's a good person to follow in that line. Okay, so. He had suggested this to Tom. Now the wires start. Hope to have some further word from you soon concerning the naval painting assignment, Tom Lee. And writing you a letter today about naval assignment, Dan Longwell. You know, today all of this would be done digitally. They didn't even have cell phones then. They certainly didn't have all these gadgets of Facebook and so forth. And it's odd. I have not even found a reference to a phone call. And I have read through 90 archival boxes. The correspondence between these two gentlemen is 240 pages. Uh, not, I'm not reading you all that today. But we wouldn't be able to be having this meeting or this presentation if we didn't have this paper. So I want to suggest to everybody who has any interest in paper or in history, save your letters. And if you're an important person, get them archived somewhere. Okay, now here's the letter from Longwell that tells him we're finally going to meet. Dear Tom Lee. Now notice he calls him Dear Tom Lee. I have been tied up here in New York and haven't been able to get down to Washington to talk about your assignment. The thing I suggest you're doing is, why don't you pack a bag, come and meet me in Washington, 
say a week from this Friday, meet me at the Carlton Hotel, etc. I am so sorry. I have been so long on this that there have been many complications which I will explain to you later. All through this correspondence, there's a lot more from Tom Lee than there is from Dan Longwell. But Dan was, you know, had other fish to fry. You don't put out a weekly magazine with lots of photographs and text just overnight. So, and I'm sure Tom understood that. Delighted to meet you Friday morning at the at uh, no, October 3rd at the Carlton Hotel. Blah blah blah. Uh, and I am this is from Tom Lee. You can count on my being there and embarrassed to ask for advancement, but if you could wire three hundred dollars for traveling and my family household expenses during my absence, I would be very grateful. Hope to hear from you right away so I can plan the departure. You will also find that getting money back and forth was something of an issue. Uh, then he, he gets the money. Most grateful for the $300 just received. We'll meet you at the Carlton Hotel. They meet. They go see Mr. Uh, Admiral Hepburn. Hepburn is impressed with Tom Lee. They had dinner together and so forth. And so the assignment to go to Argentia is in place. Then Tom Lee writes back, this is now, all of this took place in early October. Now we're at October 14, 41. Dear Mr. Longwell, I would like to tell you how much I enjoyed meeting you and to say sincerely that I can think of nothing I would rather be doing than working for an outfit like yours. I will be waiting for a word from you, ready to come back east any time. Knowing the troubles you've had in arranging my job, I feel more than ever the heavy responsibility on my shoulders to make my work worth the pains you're taking to give me the chance to do it. You can be absolutely sure that whatever I've got, I'll use. To keep our records straight, I have many talks about the $300 and how to spend it. <laughs> now, Dan is addressing him. Dear Lee, it was nice seeing you. All letters are now off to the Navy, and we'll have to wait to hear from them. Finally, the assignment comes through, but he can't get out of El Paso. There's a war on, and there are troops going to and fro, and the trains and the airplanes are busy. Trying to airline reservations for Tuesday. If successful, we'll be in your office. If okay, please, if possible, wire some money for traveling. Hooray, I'm delighted. I just love what comes through people's own words. Uh, then he talks about the only reservations for American Airlines were later, so he's trying to get on some other kind of transport. Dan writes letters for him to carry with him to whom it may concern, and he tells the whole story of what it was like getting Tom Lee's first works done uh, with Sergeant Beaver and how it was so helpful and that he feels sure the military is going to appreciate. And they did, really, they did. Um, there was a, this is just another one where <laughs> he's on his way truly to Argentina and said, Could you possibly send another hundred dollars to carry just in case I need it. Then we have a handwritten letter. And had I known soon enough or how to go about it, it would have been fine to show you the handwriting of Tom Lee. And you can tell how important the letter is by how he's written. If it's just straight business, it's typed. If it's sort of personal, it's handwritten. And if it's really important, it's in calligraphy, which is beautiful. This one is just handwritten. Dear Mr. Longwell, December 23rd, 1941. He's home now from Argentina. Arrived home in good shape and have started the first painting of the gray old mother tender and her deadly children in the grim northern bay. It is all so vivid that I can hardly live with myself. 
I'll keep you posted on the paintings and the progress. The work is going full blast. Now that particular painting he's discussing is a ship called the Prairie. And he had painted a, a watercolor of her with three destroyers. And they look like little bitty ships. Well, in September, the prairie caught fire. And so even though they ran, life ran the early Argentia story, they wrote it again. I mean, they published that painting again in September. Then we come to June 1942. He's asking to go out again. He's finished those paintings. See, Bill, you said people would walk out if I kept reading all these letters. <laughs> Dear Mr. Longwell, in your office last March, you told me to write you when I was ready to go out again to paint some more pictures. It has taken longer to get squared away than I had planned. I painted and installed a mural for the Little Texas Post Office and some other odd jobs. I've been to the hospital and had a much needed operation. I've had my Rosenwald Fellowship suspended for the duration of the war, so I'm free of that responsibility. I've even been to my local draft board to see if there's any immediate prospect of a change in my present 3A classification. The board tells me they see no change for at least several months, so I'm ready to go. I've received a, quite a stack of letters addressed from Tom Lee, addressed just to Tom Lee, El Paso, Texas, from all kinds of people all over the country about my Navy pictures. These letters have warmed my heart. People wrote to ask if the boy on the extreme right wasn't Torpedo Man Jimmy Donnelly, or if the summer wasn't the long, or if the gunner wasn't the long lost brother named C.E. Reader, or if by chance I had met the fiance who was an ensign on the USS something. An executive officer of a four piper wrote, permit me to say that you have accurately shown incidents of everyday life aboard the destroyer up north. Where can I get copies of these paintings? A fine old lady in Pasadena who had just christened the new USS Woodworth wrote to say she'd been knitting helmets for months now. I'd shown her the men that needed them. And would I be so kind enough to let her know where to send them. The captain in the command of an aircraft carrier wrote, the issue of May 25th caught up with me yesterday and I've been admiring your work every few minutes ever since. And this letter goes on and on, talking about the personal responses and letters he had had from readers across the country. And it's very impressive. And it just goes to show that an artist can truly translate action for the viewing public. Uh, and then the Navy tells Longwell they can send Tom Lee to the Pacific if they want to. That was in May 30th of 1942. June 10th of 42, Tom writes that he's he wrote that he was willing, he would like to go to the Pacific. Well, I read you that. And then Margie Varga. Now, there are a lot of pieces of correspondence with her because she was the director of art for, or the art director of Life Magazine. And she was the person that Tom Lee communicated most with. He trusted her immensely. There are portrait, there are there's correspondence where he says, I've sent the paintings, but they're not yet varnished. I trust you to do it. And I think that's, <laughs> anyway, he had written that he wanted to go. And she's written back to him, and I thought you might get this. Dear Tom, we are all tickled pink at your letters this morning, saying that you would consider going out on a job. I believe Mr. Longwell is writing you about it. Certainly Admiral Hepburn will be glad to hear of it too. We haven't, been, and then she discusses what hasn't been able to be published, but they're holding it for the future. Tom submitted way more than was ever published. And uh, that is just the problem with 
public. That's just the problem in publishing a magazine. You have so much space, you have so much time, and so, but I did talk, they published more Tom's than anybody else's. Then here is a wire from Dan Longwell to Tom. That was wonderful news that you are underway. Soon you will get to your post. Look up John Hersey. John Hersey was working for Life. I don't know if you know who that is. He wrote a, a book on Hiroshima that uh, I read in high school that is stunning. Anyhow, he was a fine author as well and worked with Life. And it was important that uh, Dan put John in touch with Tom Lee to lead him around, and, and I'll tell you why that was important later on. Uh, public relations will know where to find John Hersey. One final thing. I wrote Admiral Hepburn and said that Life and Tom Lee agreed to the same provisions for this trip as for others. That is, all painting and sketches to be property of Navy and Life to pay you. I also agreed that Life and Tom Lee absolve the Navy of any responsibility for your safety. To this end, we have taken out $25,000 insurance for you. Now remember, this is 1942. If this is all an agreement, perhaps you better wire me so I can file this wire with your, your answer in the Hepburn letter. All good luck. And when Tom Prideau heard this news, he said, gee, I wish he would write a book. Tom Prideau was the entertainment editor at Life. July 21, 1942. Now we have the first salutation of Dan Longwell to Tom Lee, where he simply says, Dear Tom. That insurance policy was standard and covers all the contingencies. The only thing it doesn't cover is riding around in submarines. So if you get some inspiration to go underwater, simply cable me, double my life insurance rate, and we will cover the submarine contingency too. The insurance for that costs twice as much. And Tom wires that he's arrived in the Pacific and they'll hear from him in a week or so. Then Mr. Longwell writes to Admiral Nimitz and tells him that Tom Lee is in his command. Now this became important because, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second. I know that if you've been attending the Tom Lee lectures on World War II, that you know that he was just off of the ship, the Wasp, when it was torpedoed and sunk. And he watched the whole thing from a uh, telescope on the ship that he was on. And oddly enough, at the very moment that the fires hit the magazine and this huge explosion, that's when it was his turn at the telescope watching this disaster. And that's what he painted. Uh, and the Navy did not release this, the photographs that they had until October 26th. However, I think Life Magazine must have had some of those because on October 27th, Longwell wires to Lee. You don't think that you could do double page spread sketch on WASP for this week and get it to us airmail by Saturday with your own eyewitness account, do you? Then later you can make the painting. We are going to press with a big story on the Guadalcanal this Saturday. Why are you what you think? You know, when you think back on this, it's fascinating that they're working in New York and the Pacific by wires, getting closing, closing down the publication, you know, and starting it in. Anyway, Tom Lee wires back. My eyewitness sketch more valuable than anything I could do now. Definitely will read to Washington Thursday. Have Macklin pick it up. You must understand travel delays make these movements difficult. Regards, Tom Lee. Now, the next thing, he manages to get to Pearl Harbor 
And when he does, he has an argument, a sort of an argument, with customs or something. Anyway, he said, call the public relations people, and they did. Anyhow, he was immediately uh, collected by a jeep and taken directly to Admiral Nimitz's office. And they had some easy conversation, and finally Nimitz said to him, when did you leave the Hornet? Oh, it, Tom Lee had gone from the Wasp to another ship and then onto the Hornet. And the Hornet was sunk, and Lee did not know it. But because Longwell had told Admiral Nimitz that Tom Lee was in his command, that name, you know, stuck. He knew that that was an important person to deal with. And Nimitz is the one that told Lee that the Hornet had all his friends had been hit and it had gone down. And Lee reports that they both sort of had tears in their eyes. They then got Lee home. And he writes back to Margie Varga in a wire, just arrived by plane, dog tired, and so very lucky. My sketch is being forwarded from Synpac to Navy Department. I'm resting until tomorrow, then going to El Paso. Sarah and I will come to New York. Please wire $500 to me immediately at Palace Hotel San Francisco. Let me hear from you. My greetings and affection to you all. I have a story and I'm looking forward to seeing you and feel very thankful. Tom Lee. During that time, of course, his family wasn't able to get mail, and so Margie Varga was writing to Sarah and telling her where Tom was and what was going on. Uh, there's a nice letter here from Sarah saying, thank you for doing that. Tom Lee also wrote his father when he was on the Hornet about how what wonderful men they were and what a good experience it was. This, of course, predates the sinking, but that, that just goes to show. And, and oh, I'm sorry. And then uh, Tom Lee Sr. sent that letter to Longwell saying, just wanted to brag on my son. Hope you don't mind my sending this letter. And then, of course, he, do I have any art students in the audience? No. Okay. In that case, I'm not going to read this, but he describes there what the sinking of the was and how he took notes while he was sketching and the colors and so forth that he chose to use and how it was difficult to take something that, well, just how to deal with it. So if, if you ever come to an art student, who wants to do a research paper on the work of Tom Lee, I have lots of material to help with. Okay. Uh, and I'm just throwing this in because I think it's kind of amusing. This is February now, 1943. Tom has sent 18 drawings and the written material to accompany them, which means over 300 hours of work has been used to accomplish the job and it all comes from my heart. Uh, and then at the very last paragraph, Margie, we are flat broke. We have had no income at all since last June when Dan paid me $1,000 advance on my fee. Sarah has been wonderful about eking it out, but now it's all gone together. With about 200 I had left over from expenses money. <laughs> it goes on anyway. Well, Van Longwell decides how to solve this problem of this money. And in February 18th of 43, he hires Tom Lee full-time onto the staff of Life Magazine. Dear Tom, I have your letter in which you appeal to me to help you decide whether you should continue your work as a war correspondent and whether I think it is right that you should. I must strongly urge you, Tom, that you not only make an appeal to your draft board, but that we should make an appeal that you be allowed to continue to do exactly what you have been doing for us since November of 1941. 
From our experience, we have found that you have a unique gift, not only in portraying what the men in action are up against in a way that bolsters the public's confidence in them, but I have heard from many of the men in the services themselves how greatly your painting and reporting bolsters them too. We should regularize your position a little more. You have been a war correspondent and you are accredited as such to both the Atlantic and the Pacific fleets as a representative of Life Magazine. But you've been paid by us in fees because that's the normal way of paying artists. I think you should come onto our staff at a regular salary. You to work under the same arrangements you have been working under. But in fairness to you, and to make it easier for you, I think you ought to go on a regular salary as an employee of Time Incorporated and one of our staff war correspondents. I'm turning, okay, that's the basic part of that letter. And then he sends Tom more letters about to give to the draft boards and to send it to give to anyone to give that to whom it may concern kind of letter. About the salary thing, I just as soon start you out on that any time. I had in mind six thousand dollars a year in expenses, but you better go over your budgets and see if that's going to be enough. I don't want you to worry about money for Sarah or anyone while you're doing work of this sort. You know your expenses better than I do. I don't know how many of you have been hired by somebody who said, what do you want to be paid? And he writes back, dear Dan, Sarah and I are overwhelmed with your letters and your offer to put me on staff. As to the amount of the salary, your offer of 6,000 plus my traveling expenses seems splendid to both of us. In doing the job for you, I consider I am working for my country. Then the Hornet pictures are, I'm beginning to, um, okay, the Hornet is published. That's a big success. The Wasp paintings are published Many prints are made and they're sent to the Navy and they are also sent to Tom and he's grateful for that. And uh, there's a showing in Washington of his work and Dan writes to him saying, your paintings were much admired in the Washington show. And he discusses congressmen who come up and comment. And he said, they kept coming up to any of us connected with life and saying, you know, Tom Lee is a Texas man. Uh, and I'm about at the end of my time, and I'm going to skip forward here now, because we've not talked about what happened when he came home from the war. As if you've been going to other Tom Lee performances, you know that he was on Peleliu, and he went there with pencils and brushes, and everybody else had rifles and hand grenades and was pinned down for a couple of hours. And the paintings that he brought back from that were so dramatic, it just that's all you can say about it. They were just totally dramatic. And I think that not only did they, were they effective to the reading public, Peleliu, I think, affected him. And he sort of lost his interest in war, shall we say. And he got home quickly. Uh, and Longwell wanted to keep him on staff and did, but he sent him on assignments that were not quite so dangerous. They were not safe because he was flying around the globe about 35 the mileage that he, uh, I can't give you the figure. But anyway, he was doing a story on the airplanes for the, uh, services, and he went clear around the globe. He was in Africa. He was in China. And they ran into a bit of a problem. He did wonderful portraits of Madame Chiang Kai-shek and General uh, Chiang Kai-shek, and 
Luce would not print them. Luce was very pro-Chinese, and he was very pro the Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, well, that's just a whole other story that I don't have time to go into. But Tom's work, the uh, landscapes that he did of China were printed. But the ones that he did of uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek was not, and that's too bad. But I was very glad to see them printed in the Matt Greeley book because they are good. Uh, okay, then we are into 1944, and the company thought you did such good work last year, Tom, that they wanted to give you a little extra bonus, and they did. Tom's letter to Dan in 1944, March. Your letter with the handsome bonus just came. I want to write and tell you how very much I appreciate it. Money will come in handy. Thank you, Dan. And this is a chance to tell you again how damn happy I am working for you. And then he talks about the Chinese business. And I'm going to have to skip all that because I want to take you to the very last. It's, the letters about the cattle stories and the brave bull stories are wonderful. I just loved it because Longwell said, I don't want you to go back to Japan. You've made the right decision. Don't go. Let's do cattle. And so Tom Lee starts out working on cattle and then he discovers bulls. And so now we have the history of cattle and the brave bulls. And everyone enjoyed that. And then that became the King Ranch book, which he did with Holland McCombs, and Holland McCombs was a researcher, did way more research than Tom Abel <laughs> really enjoyed dealing with, and I certainly appreciate that. Uh, the last letter that went to the Longwells was written after uh, Dan had retired to my hometown, Neosho, and he, in, 10 years later, had a, a stroke, and he never really recovered from it. And in August 68, Tom Lee wrote this letter to Mary and Dan. And it's in calligraphy. Dear Mary and Dan, we just returned from a <laughs> I can't get through this letter. We just returned from a fishing trip in Colorado to fly Mary's letter, which made us both very happy here. I'm glad you received the picture gallery. That was a book that he done. I told Ned Bradford I wanted you to have a copy sent direct from Beacon Street just as soon as a completed set was available. I was very anxious to have you read the text volume. I hope it shows clearly how very deeply I am indebted to my friend, <laughs> to my friend Dan Longwell. I hope it holds some hint of my gratefulness to him. It seems the right time now to say to you, Dan, that I never considered that I was working for a magazine or for a corporation. Those four years I worked for one man. I worked for my respected friend, Dan Long. I'm very proud of that part of my life, working for you. And I'm sorry, but that's the friendship that they had. Dan died in November of 1968, a few months after this note was written. And Life Magazine died in December of 1972. And I'm awfully glad that Tom Lee did not die, but continued on his fine career. And I thank you for listening to all of this. And it's been my pleasure to be here. <laughs>